in addition to praying the rosary on the five first Saturdays of the month and making the communion of reparation, Our Lady has asked us to keep her company for 15 minutes, meditating upon one of the mysteries contained in her holy rosary. Today we join her in contemplating the Transfiguration. Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich paints the scene for us, taking with him Peter, John, and James the Greater. The Lord proceeded up the mountain by a footpath. They spent nearly two hours in ascent, for Jesus paused frequently at the different caves and places made memorable by the surgeon of the prophets. There he explained to them manifold mysteries and united with them in prayer. They had no provisions, for Jesus had forbidden them to bring any, saying that they would be satisfied to overflowing. The view from the summit of the mountain extended far and wide. On it was a large open place surrounded by a wall and shade trees. The ground was covered with aromatic herbs and sweet scented flowers. Saint Bridget shares with us teaching from the journey up the mountain. She says, the kind of wisdom that leads to a blessed life involves a rocky approach and a steep climb. Inasmuch as resisting your passions seems a hard and rocky way. It involves a steep climb to spurn habitual pleasures and not to love worldly honours. Although it is difficult, yet for the person who reflects on how little time there is and how the world will end and who fixes his mind constantly on God above the mountain, there will appear a cloud, that is, the consolation of the Holy Spirit. Such consolation seems dark to the lovers of this world, for they love darkness. But to the lovers of God, it is brighter than the sun and shines more than gold. Thus teaches St. Bridget of Sweden on the hidden meaning of the transfiguration as a journey each one of us must replicate as we fight our wicked passions in order to reach the summit and union with God. Venerable Mary of Agrita explains, During our Lord's transfiguration, the Blessed Mary, who was mystically present, saw not only the humanity of Christ our Lord transformed in glory, but she was favoured by an intuitive and clear vision of the divinity itself. For the Lord wished her to partake of the privilege implied in being present at this event in a more abundant and distinguished manner than the Apostles. What a revelation! What a secret revealed through the writings of this holy mystic that Our Lady was present at the Transfiguration. Venerable Mary explains why she was present. There was no necessity of confirming the Most Holy Mother in her faith, as was necessary with the Apostles, for she was invincibly confirmed in faith. But the Lord had many different objects in view at His Transfiguration, and there were special reasons for His 
not wishing to celebrate this great event without the presence of his most holy mother. What for the apostles was a gratuitous favour, was a duty in regard to the queen and mother, since she was his companion and co-partner in the works of the redemption, even to the foot of the cross. It was proper to fortify her by this favour against the torments in store for her most holy soul. And furthermore, Venerable Mary of Agrida gives us another reason as to Our Lady's presence at the Transfiguration. She adds, Our Lady was to remain on earth as a teacher of the Holy Church. Therefore it was proper that she should also be one of the eyewitnesses of this great mystery. Our Lady, teacher of the Holy Church, of the Apostles, Our Lady so acquainted with our Lord's life as to be able to share it with others. Indeed, perhaps this was the wisdom behind Saint John Paul II, including this mystery in the Rosary. The Transfiguration could be included because Our Lady was mystically, mysteriously present. In every mystery, we join Our Lady in contemplating her Son. Of course, Our Lady must have been mystically present by a bilocation in order to contemplate the Transfiguration. Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich describes the scene at the top of the mountain. The Apostles lay ravished in ecstasy rather than in sleep, prostrate on their faces. She adds, Then I saw three shining figures approaching Jesus in the light. Their coming appeared perfectly natural. It was like that of one who steps from the darkness of night into a place brilliantly illuminated. Two of them appeared in a more definite form, a form more like the corporeal. They addressed Jesus to converse with him. They were Moses and Elijah. The third apparition spoke no word. It was more ethereal, more spiritual. That was Malachi. Saint Alphonsus explains further the response of the apostles. Ravished with joy and delight, Saint Peter exclaimed, Lord, it is good for us to be here. That is, Lord, let us remain here. Let us never more depart from this place, for the sight of your beauty consoles us more than all the delights of the earth. Indeed, the Lord wished to give his disciples a glimpse of the glory of paradise in order to animate them to labor for the divine honor. And so, brethren, the saint adds, let us labor during the remainder of our lives to gain heaven. Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich draws us into the conversation of our Lord and the illuminated prophets. Jesus spoke with them of all the sufferings he had endured up to the present and of all that still awaited him. He related the history of his passion in detail, point for point. Elijah and Moses frequently expressed their emotion and joy. Their words were full of sympathy and consolation, of reverence for the Saviour and of uninterrupted praises of God. They constantly referred to the types of the mysteries of which Jesus was speaking and praised God for having from all eternity dwelt in mercy towards his people. Malachi kept silence. The 
the disciples raised their heads, gazing long upon the glory of Jesus and beheld Moses, Elijah and Malachi. When, in describing his passion, Jesus came to his exaltation on the cross, he extended his arms at the word, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. His face was turned towards the south. He was entirely penetrated with light and his robe flash, flashed with a bluish white gleam. He, the prophets and the three apostles all were raised above the earth. When they had all returned to their usual waking state, a cloud of white light descended upon them, like the morning dew floating over the meadows. I saw the heavens open above Jesus and the vision of the Most Holy Trinity. A stream of light descended upon Jesus, and the apostles heard above them, like a sweet, gentle sighing, a voice pronouncing the words, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, listen to him. Fear and trembling fell upon them, overcome by the sense of their own human weakness and the glory they beheld. They cast themselves face downwards on the earth. They trembled in the presence of Jesus, in whose favor they had just heard the testimony of his heavenly Father. Jesus went to them, touched them and said, Arise, do not be afraid. They arose and beheld Jesus alone. It was now approaching three in the morning. The grey dawn was glimmering in the heavens and the damp vapours were hanging over the country around the foot of the mountain. The apostles were silent through the fear of what they had seen. Venerable Mary explains once again Our Lady's presence. Whereas the apostles were asleep when Jesus at the beginning of this mysterious glorification retired to pray, and then when they woke, they so quickly fell with their faces to the earth in fear, the Blessed Mother responded very differently. She witnessed and heard all these events without undue excitement, for besides being accustomed to such great manifestations of glory, she was divinely fortified and enlightened for looking upon the divinity. Hence, she was enabled to look fixedly upon the glorified body without experiencing the terror and weakness of the senses which overtook the apostles. No human ingenuity can suffice fully to describe the effects of this glorious vision of her son on her most holy soul. With innermost gratitude and deepest penetration, she began to ponder upon what she had seen and heard. Exalted praise of the omnipotent God welled forth from her lips when she considered how her eyes had seen refulgent in glory that same bodily substance which had been formed of her blood, carried in her womb and nursed at her breast. How she had with her own ears heard the voice of the Eternal Father acknowledge her son as his own and appoint him as the teacher of all the human race. With her holy angels, she composed new canticles to celebrate an event so full of festive joy for her soul and for the most sacred humanity of her son. Saint Athanasius now looks towards us and calls us. Let us run with confidence and joy to enter into the cloud like Moses and Elijah, or like James and John. Let us be caught up like Peter to behold the divine vision and to be transfigured by that glorious transfiguration. Let us retire from the world, detach ourselves from the earth, rise above the body, cut ourselves off from creatures 
and turned to the Creator, to whom Peter in ecstasy exclaimed, Lord, it is good for us to be here. It is indeed good to be here as you have said, Peter. It is good to be with Jesus and to remain with him forever. What greater happiness or higher honour could we have than to be with God, to be made like him and to live in his light? The Byzantine liturgy of the 9th century proclaims, You were transfigured on the mountain, O Christ our God. Your disciples beheld your glory as far as they could see it, so that when they would behold you crucified, they would understand that your suffering was voluntary and would proclaim to the world that you are truly the radiance of the Father. Let your everlasting light also shine upon us sinners through the prayers of the Mother of God. O giver of light, all glory to you.